The Chrysanthemum and the Sword by Ruth Benedict is a captivating exploration of Japanese culture. Dr. Benedict conducted a research with a practical purpose in mind to assist American policymakers in understanding Japan during wartime and in planning the occupation. However, many people are unaware of the significant role Benedict's analysis of the Japanese character structure played in our success in these endeavors. While we acknowledge the importance of considering national character in modern warfare and international planning, it can be challenging to grasp the immense significance of a systematic psychological analysis particularly when dealing with a culture as foreign as Japan's. Thus even if the book's engaging narrative style alone may not be enough to recommend it, given that Japan may still be of somewhat remote interest to some, it will surely appeal to individuals interested in the methodological aspects of international understanding. It demonstrates in a captivating manner the practical significance of studying the basic assumptions which any nation makes about living, the solutions it has sanctioned. Benedict's main argument is that in order to effectively interact with a people, whether in war or peace, it is crucial to understand how they will react in a given situation. However, as highlighted in the second chapter, this is no easy task when it comes to the Japanese. Their behavior is challenging to predict, as our descriptive vocabulary is rife with contradictory assertions about by challenging our assumption that the Japanese are fundamentally similar to Americans, Benedict gradually paints a comprehensive picture of the Japanese, unveiling their unique pattern design for living that sets them apart from us. Through this new perspective, their previously unintelligible behavior becomes easier to predict as contradictions dissipate when we substitute Japanese premises of action for our own. The primary focus of the book is on the cognitive level, examining how the Japanese tend to define situations, their ideal behavioral patterns, and their expectations of others' reactions. The evidence presented is drawn from Japan's conduct during the war, the evolution of its social history, and first-hand accounts of Japanese behavior from various social classes. The author also conducts explorations of Japanese culture alongside those who have truly experienced it. Throughout nine chapters, the book acquaints readers with the fundamental premises underlying the Japanese logic of living. One of the most basic premises is the importance of knowing and accepting one's proper place in a hierarchical structure. Status differences are clearly defined, and individuals are taught the specific behavior expected in each situation from an early age. For example, a three-year-old boy understands that he can playfully disrupt his mother's elaborate hairdo without consequences because he recognizes the gender-based hierarchy. Interclass relationships in Japan also operate within a well-defined and elaborate hierarchical order, with the rights, privileges, and obligations of each group clearly established. The historical material presented in connection with these premises sheds light on the conditions of Japanese cooperation with the occupying troops. Intertwined with the emphasis on hierarchy is the recognition of indebtedness towards others. While Western cultures often value self-made success, the Japanese consider recognition of one's place in a network of mutual indebtedness to be virtuous. The book discusses how Americans may struggle to understand the Japanese sensitivity to trifles and their willingness to bear a heavy burden of indebtedness without resentment. This awareness of indebtedness translates into a strong sense of obligation to pay off debts whenever possible and the book dedicates four chapters to classifying the various forms of debts within Japanese society. Another characteristic Japanese premise explored in the book is the acceptance of self-gratification, which may be considered sinful or unhealthy by puritanical Western standards. 
as long as it does not interfere with the serious affairs of life. Additionally, a chapter is dedicated to explaining the frequent difficulty in fulfilling one's duty in Japan. Japanese life consists of separate circles, each with its own code of proper behavior. And adhering to one code often conflicts with the claims of another. This conflict between different codes of duty, more prevalent in Japan than the conflict between personal wishes and a sense of duty often experienced in the West, holds a deep poignancy for the Japanese people. It is not surprising that willpower should be emphasized in Japan to a greater extent than in any other country. However, The Japanese do not view the cultivation of willpower as self frustration, but rather as a means to fully savor life. Benedict describes the socialization process in Japan outlined in a chapter titled The Child Learns. She attributes many of the seemingly contradictory Japanese personality characteristics. To the traumatic discontinuity between the extraordinary freedom of early life and the severe restrictions that come later. Realistic self confidence is traced back to the early period, while neurotic sensitivity and timidity are seen as reflections of later training. In her suggestions for the democratization of Japan, Benedict focuses on aspects of adolescent training. Such as the system of teasing in the army and secondary schools, which fosters intense aggression. The book's analysis of Japanese reactions to defeat and occupation demonstrates the pragmatic adequacy of Benedict's analytical tools. The reader finds themselves in agreement with the advocated approach of working through the emperor and trusting the Japanese to turn over a new leaf. As successfully followed by the high command. An intriguing result of reading the book is a desire to predict future changes in Japan and update the picture left by Benedict, primarily focused on the pre war era. However, questions arise regarding Benedict's assumptions. The reviewer believes that she does not delve deep enough into her motivational analysis, both at the societal and individual level. The reviewer suggests that more analytical concepts from sociology and psychology should have supplemented or anthropological tools. Economic reasons related to Japan's population growth, for instance, are not mentioned as motives for going to war. The reviewer also points out societal strains arising from the clash between industrial civilizations' universalism. And Japan's emphasis on particularism. On the psychological level, the reviewer finds limitations in an approach that places total emphasis on the articulations of a cultural pattern. The reviewer suggests that a fuller use of psychoanalytic concepts of personality formation could have resulted in broader generalizations and greater predictive power. The reviewer contends that Benedict's explanation of the Japanese sense of duty in terms of their concepts of virtue may be putting the cart before the horse. The deep influence of strict anal disciplines suggests the Japanese may require a form of compulsive morality. Which accounts for their readiness to transmit cultural learning to the next generation. 